foul on the crowd, guys. What? I thought they were protesting Trump at first. <laughs> Officially seeing everything, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go see what the science is all about. What are they doing? This, ladies and gentlemen. What? No clue what's going on, but we got to get on the other side of the street, folks. the cars.
Responsible for getting this together. Judy, where are you? Judy. Judy. Amber, where are you, Amber? There's Amber over here. Christina? Where's Christina? Ah, oh, right here. All right. And Christina's two daughters. Responsible for getting our, our mics up here. Janet. Janet. Janet right here. Bob Kennedy, where are you? Bob. Bob Kennedy was right here in my back pocket a minute ago. Uh, and last but not least, Nathaniel Borenstein. Like our chant ask, why are we marching? Science. 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 To me, it's to support scientific awareness. Solid, peer-reviewed, consensus-driven science that can't be swept aside by politics. We want to impress our concern and get our message out. Now to speak on matters scientific, Dr. Nathaniel Borenstein. Thank you. It's a great honor and delight to be here with so many of you today as Alpina. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. It's a great honor and delight to be here with so many people from Northern Michigan as we come together and march for science. Except that we're not really marching for science. The march for science is a catchy phrase, but not all science is, is equally uh, marchable. German scientists figured out how to use Zyklon B for more efficient mass murder. I'm not marching for that because it's evil. And a serious scientific study once established that if you drop a piece of buttered bread, it will actually land on the buttered side more often than not. <laughs> I'm not marching for that because it's pointless. So what are we marching for? Generally speaking, we're here to show our support for science-based public policy, and for basic education in the scientific method. Every American should know how to critically evaluate a scientific claim, and we should all pay attention to things like safety studies of nuclear energy. Most science isn't controversial in the first place, and among those issues that are controversial, climate change alone is a matter of life and death for the planet. When Galileo maintained that the Earth revolves around the sun, he wasn't merely explaining the results of scientific reasoning. He was also speaking in direct opposition to a widespread belief at the time, which held that the Bible declared that the sun moved around the Earth. Ultimately, he was forced to recant at the risk of his life. But most scientific discoveries don't pose such a threat to religion. 
the discovery of electromagnetism didn't alarm religious believers because it isn't discussed in the Bible in the slightest. Today there are those who deny science on a number of topics, but they are not equivalent, and it's a mistake to act like they are. In particular, there are those who doubt that human beings evolved from earlier species, those who doubt the safety of vaccines, those who doubt that human activity is changing the climate, and more. As scientists, we deplore the reasoning of all these skeptics, but it would be foolish to treat them as equivalent. Only climate change among these issues endangers all life on Earth. This is too critical to conflate it with other examples of science denial. We need to convince even those who deny science on other issues to accept its finding on this one. Some religious denominations deny evolution because of their literal interpretation of the Bible. Their views are based on deep religious beliefs, which deserve respect even from those of us who give more credence to science than scripture. In the long run, that battle will be won the same way Galileo's was won. Over time, accumulating evidence will force a reevaluation of the meaning of imprecise biblical verses. Climate change is different. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the climate will not be changing millennia after the Bible was written. To the best of my knowledge, no one's religious beliefs are actually threatened by the observation that humans are warming the planet. Climate change denial is no more grounded in the Bible than a belief that electromagnetism is sorcery. People who believe the earth is flat are harmless kooks. People who believe vaccinations cause disease are a danger to the health of our children and our community, but not the planet as a whole. When the tobacco companies spent decades denying clear evidence of the health dangers of smoking, they endangered every smoker and those near to them, but not the entire world. People who believe this world was created a few thousand years ago endanger their children's education, but not much else. In contrast, people who deny climate change endanger everything we know. We have to prioritize these issues, especially up here in the North Country, where so many of our neighbors and ourselves are people of deep religious faith. We have to, um, we have to talk with them and, and make sure they understand that their faith does not deny evolution. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Um, <laughs> we, we do not need to do that, sorry. Um, there's a time for arguing with, with them, but the time is not now. With the ice caps melting, we don't have the luxury of challenging scientific skeptics at every turn. On the other hand, many religious Christians are climate deniers, but only because of what they hear on Fox News, not because of arguments for scripture. This makes them potentially more persuadable. In fact, the Bible is full of verses urging humans to be good stewards of the earth. Fighting climate change means trying to convince the world, I'm sorry, tr tr trying to preserve the world God gave us. It should be much easier to convince our religious neighbors to oppose climate change than to change their minds about evolution. We must choose <laughs> our battles wisely. In 1633, Galileo made a tactical decision agreeing to avoid being killed by renouncing his belief that the earth revolves around the sun. So too, today, we may need to postpone, though not renounce, disputes over some scientific truths to avoid the death of our entire planet. After he recanted his heliocentric conclusions, Galileo wrote in his journal famously, a pur si muove, and yet it moves. Just as Galileo was vindicated by later generations, we can, if necessary, leave arguments about evolution to our grandchildren's grandchildren. Those of us alive today must focus on the issue that threatens the entire world. At this critical moment in history, we must be clear on our priorities and tailor our arguments carefully per for persuadable climate spe skeptics, avoiding extraneous issues that will only make things harder. But quietly, under our breath, we may still murmur an echo of Galileo, e pur ci siamo evoluti, and yet we evolved. Let us always defend the truth, but let us fight most fiercely where the truth matters most. Thank you. Um, modeled mathematically. Dr. Bora? Good afternoon. It's a good preamble to present me as a student of happiness, because that's how I feel this afternoon in Alpina. Okay, now, it's, now okay. I was, was not aware of science in that domain. 
Um, I'm happy being here in Alpina. Years ago, I used to travel throughout Michigan with the Bureau of School Accreditation, visiting Michigan high schools and all schools. So it's good to be back here, having been back here in, in years. Um, when Nathaniel invited me to come to Alpina and present, uh, the image I had was a formal colloquium, like the one you go to make presentation in, in formal speeches. And, and he corrected my perception and said, no, this is science and the earth. How do they connect? So I thought about... And my presentation rests on two pillars of science. They are so well known that I did not prepare any elaboration on those two topics. The first one, and my, my wife Maria will show you, the first principle that I use is the first law of thermodynamics. Um, energy cannot be created and cannot be destroyed. It is constant. It transforms from heat energy into kinetic energy and different processes. But imagine you're in a, you have a question? I'm yay. Yay, good. <laughs> now I know what a yay means in Alpina. Um, the, um, if you imagine yourself in a closed room, a bathroom with a little water, no matter what you do, no matter if you put that on, on the stove or you, you try to disappear that, it won't go away. So that is like energy. You just cannot destroy that. It is constant. And the second principle is equally well known, is the equivalence of mass and energy. E equals mc squared. The E stands for energy, the M stands for mass, and they are equal by a proportionality constant, which is C squared, big number, but it is the same entity we're talking about. That has been proven time and time again in nuclear explosions, in theoretical physics. These two principles are there. If you happen to be unfamiliar with them, I'll be very surprised, you can Google them. First law of thermodynamics <laughs> and the, the equal MC squared. Now, what happened with us? Why is this um, the pillar of my presentation? Um, I have a... In the Henry V of William Shakespeare, he begins asking the audience to help him do the play. It's called co-creation of value. I'll be emulating Shakespeare and ask, ask you to co-create with me. So all this is symbolic, it doesn't mean anything. But imagine, you all know, you began life as a single cell organism, as a zygote. You know, in the conception, you became a single cell. If you look at yourself today, there are trillions of cells. Somebody counted 32 trillion. I don't think it's exact count, but it's a number to give you an idea of proportion. So the reflection asks, what is the difference? Where did it come from? From a single cell to a, a bunch of cells. You know, how do they happen? The accretion process of life. And we all know it's a process, I won't elaborate on that, it, me metabolism. There are processes that allow us to absorb from the external milieu and reverse processes that allow us to discharge that which has been spent through bio bi biological processes. So when we eat, um, We, we take, um, this is us, and uh, we go and eat, and we take cells, strictly speaking, for, for those of you very fastidious with scientific principles, if you want, make this an atom of calcium in your bones, an atom of iron in your blood. They come from the outside, you know. It, it's not the case that if you happen to weigh 170 pounds, the planet today is 170 pounds heavier than it was when you were born. It weighs the same, you know? So, the, this metaphor, let's get my point. If you imagine a glass of water on your hand, 
and you dip the finger in that glass with the other hand and retrieve it slowly, there will be a drop at the tip of that finger. And you can raise it and lower it down, move it left and right, do so small circles. It's a very insignificant life story, but it's a life story. It's a life story of a drop of water. If you bring it back to the, to the rim of the glass and shake it, the drop will fall back there. So for an instance, the drop had an individual story and a life story. It happens to us. We are that drop of water. But there comes a time where that personal story ends. What is left is the memory. I'm not dealing with memories or spiritual matters. I'm dealing with atoms, energy, and physics here. Um, Merge from the totality of creation, and one time we get back to that totality. Now, the reflection point here is, what we reflect, not reflection in physics, is what does that mean for us? If we are literally this planet, um, in the process of us eating, we bring stuff from the outside into our body. And we do that, and by the way, it's not that we only are takers. We go to the bathroom, we clip the nail, we go to the barber, so we're shedding back things into the planet. Instead of being an entity, isolated, we could see the human life as a riverbed through which the materials of this planet flow, and that is us. Uh, so there comes a time where this is us, a single bag, all this, you know, translucent bag doesn't show, but this is supposed to represent a human being. As as Shakespeare said, please imagine that I'm holding all the trillions of molecules of the universe here, the planet Earth is enough. And this is you, individually. And remember, by the accretion process of life, it has come from the planet to you as an individual. Um, Eventually, the drop of water goes back into the glass, and this has happened with you. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see the mix of cells that used to be used with the rest of the cells that are there. Nathaniel told me that there are studies made that the probability that you breathe one molecule of air that Julius Caesar also breathed 2,000 years ago is pretty high. I forgot what the number is, but, but we're all mixing together. We're sharing this. Even if you don't want that, even if you close your house, you put those plastic covers there, you will not avoid it. You have to drink water. You have to eat food. That exchange is continuous. So here we are. I invite you to roll this imaginary movie in your mind. Imagine yourself today, this uh, biology of the cells indicates a maximum seven year life expectancy. Nothing of what you touch today, you touch today of you was in you seven years ago. It's all brand new, you're being regenerated. Those of you very uh, insistent on being born again, you're being born again every second that you breathe, every time. <laughs> So if this is the composition that we have, if you imagine in the, in the movie making of your mind, fast forward seven years from now, this is what it, the universe would look like from your point of view. You are part of that. And it, more, more of that will come into you. This unity between the self and the totality of things is echoing passages of the Bible, is in the dollar bill of the US, is in the Jamaican, Creed, you know, uh, out of one many, is, is in, in many creeds, religion, poetry, the idea that we are together with the planets, the, behind Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, and uh, the totality of things. Um, why is the rest? Where do we stand with the rest of the planet, given that it is me? That's it. Thank you very much. I'm a happy man. Jim Schaefer gave me one minute. I was thinking about this, and I want to share it with you because you're the people that maybe can think some more about it. But I thought of a sign, but it was too late to make it. 
and it's science plus, plus ethics equals answers. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing I want you to think really hard about is that we have been fighting for clean air in Alpena for a long time, ever since I moved here 45 years ago. I've attended every hearing. We've made plants put all kinds of money into their pollution abatement. Now I want to ask you, are you going to go out and burn leaves? Are you going to go out and have a campfire? Because if you look at the 250 people here, how are you going to justify releasing totally un, uh, what do you call it, filtered carbon dioxide plus all the chemicals. If you Google the contents of wood smoke, you will not burn. I've been fighting smoke, I'm allergic to smoke. Asthma has been discovered in, in more populations in children today and the lungs of healthy children have now been found to have less capacity than they did when we were children. Why is this? Just think about those things. Thank you. Okay, words of wisdom. Uh, what announcement. I was just handed this on July. Protect the lakes to raise awareness of the need to protect our lakes uh, at local, state, and federal levels. Uh, it will take place uh, at Starlight Beach at 10 a on July 3rd, 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Okay, thank you. Um, oh yes, uh, uh, what time is that, Janet? 6.30 p.m. at the library. Uh, uh, Ed Tim will be speaking on uh, uh, the Line 5 pipeline. That's another announcement we... Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we... Uh, uh, Noah uh, Station out here with our uh, Great Lakes Fisheries and Wildlife Station here. Uh, with our Great Lakes that need to be protected by the uh, um, uh, Great Lakes Fresh Water Initiative. Uh, these are all science-backed. Uh, they're all threatened along with the National Institute of, of Health of all things. Uh, these are threatened by the proposed bu budget cuts in Washington. This is why we are marching to show that we are aware Thanks again, and give yourselves a big hand for caring and acting. And Be sure you all get your uh, uh, white pine seedling, plant a tree, save the planet. Uh, now, we're going to march down second to river and back to Noah. Thank you all for coming out. Have a great afternoon do a little window shopping at John Henry's folks. Friggs he got. What? Expensive. 25 bucks for a wine rack folks. What? <laughs> oh 
shop owner over there. Some loot, ski. Oh, the Earth Parade, it's over, folks. I've learned not to respond to what I'm going to do. 